In my ongoing attempts to punish myself via Elden Ring, I've been beating the game by only leveling one stat. So, it's time to beat Elden Ring and its DLC by only leveling dexterity. The rules for this challenge are simple. I can only level dex, and to keep things interesting, I have to use a different weapon for each of the 25 major remembrance bosses in the game. Seems easy enough. Let's get into it. I start the run as a wretch. This class has the lowest stat spread of all the options, with 10 levels in every category. And I feel like that makes it the most fair for this run. I can now start the allotted Elden Ring video gathering section. First, I find a wife and get a magic wedding ring that summons a donkey. I grab my first weapon, the stick and ball, then I head off into the lands between and murder the evil jar overlord for his shard. I pick up a cookbook, then execute my second murder on a blonde guy standing too close to a cliff. Nearby, I find my physic flask, some tears for it, as well as the charge attack talisman, and the first half of the pterodactyl medallion. I then head into Detroit for the second pterodactyl piece, and Radagon's nut for a stat boost. I then backtrack for a katana, which is another excellent dex weapon, before heading into the big wet area, where I steal a key from a dragon and use some magic teleporter to make my way to the dectus lift. I of course have zero deaths in the setup phase of this run, because I'm a big believer in playing it safe. Speaking of being safe, let's talk about today's video sponsor, NordVPN. The internet is a dangerous place and there are tons of people trying to get your data and information for their own purposes. And that's really weird. With NordVPN's threat protection, you can browse the web safely and anonymously without having to worry about having your data stolen. This also protects against malware and has an ad blocker which makes traversing the internet both safer and much more enjoyable. Here's a confession. I'm actually super uncomfortable making accounts and just in general having a presence online. Having the security of NordVPN the past few weeks has made me so much more comfortable and removed a lot of stress I didn't even know I had around being online. So if you're like me and spend most of your time on your computer, having NordVPN should be a real no-brainer. Go to nordvpn.com slash or click the link down in the description to get a great deal. Seriously, if you sign up for a year, you save over 50%. And for two years, that goes up to 70%. And having the peace of mind that you'll be secure is definitely worth it. So click the link down in the description and save yourself a bunch of money while also ensuring your safety. And thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Having finished all my gathering, I speed run through Altus to the Draconic Horse Girl. A stronger and better man would fight this boss in an honest duel. But that man is not me. I instead lure the Horse Girl to the edge of a cliff before pulling up with Katana L2s. Bang! 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 She staggers, and a little poke sends her plummeting into the abyss, and rewards me with a bunch of free runes. I'm not done with free runes though. I return to Detroit and spin to win my flail on a geriatric dragon until it dies of blood loss. Using all the runes gathered so far, I get up to 47 decks, which is pretty spicy for the first hour of this run. I take my spin to win flail to the first true boss of this run, Margaret. Unfortunately, I neglected to upgrade my ball and chain stick, and the damage is cold piss. I also forgot armor, so this is truly the suboptimal Morgan attempt. The only redeeming factor is that the flail has bleed, which kinda makes up for how bad it sucks. Marbidi also has a pretty easy move set that gives me lots of opportunities to strafe and get multiple hits in, which is good when I'm dependent on bleed for this fight. That's pretty much my whole fight breakdown. I made a bunch of mistakes, but my boy is so bad at fighting, it's not really an issue. Eventually, I somehow get a stagger, not sure how that happened, and it's GG's to the stick-wielding hobo. I take it back, the flail is goaded. S tier weapon, for sure. I mean, not really at all, but whatever. I use my newly granted access to Stormvale Castle to head up the sneaky path and grab the hook claws. I then return to the Raya Lucaria Crystal Tunnel so I can fight the Crystallion that will give me the first Smithing Stone Bell Bearing. It was kinda funny that Margaret was so easy I didn't need an upgraded weapon, but that will not be true of future bosses. So I beat a Rockman with a club until he gives me what I desire. I then head to the Sealed Tunnel in Altus where I can just run to a chest for the second Bell Bearing. Much easier. My next stop involves returning to the lakes in the Stillwater Cave. With Dex weapons, I have to hit bosses a lot. So I'm going to need talismans that boost consecutive attacks. Fortunately for me, by executing one of Melania's simps, who's become very lost, I can acquire the winged sword insignia, which will boost my attack power as long as I keep on smacking. Beautiful. Time for a new boss. I get my new hook claws up to plus 12 and equip my new talisman before heading in to give Godric the Goon Lord a try. 
Initially, I am not impressed by the damage. However, my first impression was wrong. So, 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 so wrong. The hook claw is straight up bang. The wing sword insignia combined with how fast these hit makes a pretty nasty combination. I also once again have bleed, which makes this pretty good weapon into a great weapon. Godrico tries to phase transition, which is a legitimately bad move because he stands still to spray his dragon fire and sets me up perfectly to scratch him like an angry cat. Hey, holy shit, dude. I didn't think the claws were going to be that good. God damn. Put some respect on Wolverine's name. Holy shit. All right, so that was too easy. Is Dex OP? Not sure yet, but let's get a new weapon for the next big baddie. I'm going to pull out a classic here. I mosey on over to Dare Willy, the Bloodhound Knight, and once again abuse the disgusting atrocity that is the claws to steal his sword, the almighty Bloodhound's Fang. With my weapon in hand, I head to Radon Part 1. Not to fight him, but just to get a somber 5. I then also traverse Mount Gelmir, which sucked, to get a somber 6. I talk to my boy EG and get the Fang all the way to plus 6 before pulling up on the King of Detroit. Ramen Parte Uno can be a bit of a bitch with low vig. However, I've had to do this several times now, and I'm starting to look like a real Elden Ring professional in this fight. That is however just a facade. I'm initially pretty scared in this fight because he can do all kinds of randy shit, and one gentle love tap from him will end my humble life. I do start to feel pretty good once he does his gravity slam. I get some free hits in here, and once he does the second slam, I can dodge in front of him to guarantee his next move is the bubble explosion and get in a full weapon art with bleed, which does a metric gigaton of damage, before he takes off to become an orbital strike. It's pretty hard to hit a rat coming in at Mach Fuck from outer space though, so he misses, and I get the luckiest stagger of all time to start phase two. I think it's safe to say I cooked here. Bang! Ooh, yo! That was a really good Radon fight, holy shit. Having thoroughly destroyed the first few bosses, I decide it's time to gear up for a trip into Landell. I grab a plethora of items, including the Twin Blade, Twin Knight Swords, Raptor Talons, Raptor's Black Feathers, Jump Attack Talisman, Spiked Castus, Craig Blade, the Misery Cord, and the Iron Wet Blade. So yeah, a bunch of shit. I upgrade the Castus to plus 12, toss Craig Blade and the Keen Attunement on them, before wandering my happy ass through the capital, to fist the piss ghost. And off rip, I like this plan. The damage looks good, and like all dex weapons, these pull replacements for the iron balls hit quick. I have the jump attack talisman and the feathers on as well, so the punish for jumping the spiky stone stomp is actually one of my best attack opportunities. This fight ends up being a lot easier than I expected. Godfrey normally isn't too bad, but with the capital scaling and me having no vig, he hits really hard. However, if I simply dodge and don't get hit, that doesn't have to be a problem. It does help that I'm fisting him pretty hard because more damage equals shorter fight, which equals less time to get hit. The setup is really just making all the math work out in my favor. Hiya! There we go. Those are pretty good for just straight physical damage. With the Golden Shower King defeated, I can venture through all of the capital now. I make sure to grab some key items like the Bolt of Grand Sacks and Lionel's Armor. I also beat up an omen killer for his mask, which will boost my strength by two if I ever need it. Nearby, there's also the Sanctified Web Blade, which will let me apply the Lightning Affinity to my weapons, which adds dex scaling and elemental damage. I grab the Ritual Shield Talisman, which should allow me to safely take hits from a lot more bosses, and go clap up Gillica's cheeks for the Ritual Sword Talisman, which lets me do more damage. And I just explained why that's a good thing. Now you may think, ratty, surely that's enough items, but no. I need something from patches. So I go kill Neji and Yura, which gets me the Reduvia and Nagakiba. Then I get to go to Patch's cave, where I use the Wolverine Claws to commit what really looks like a war crime on this poor man's. He gives me his bell bearing and I get Margit's Shackle, which will be a key factor in fighting our next boss, Morgoth. I return to Fort Height and get Bloody Slash, which I then copy and apply to both my Twin Blades to give them a blood affinity. I combined the jump attack talisman with both my new ritual talismans, and now I'm ready to show Morgato what's up. I abuse the shackle immediately upon entering the fight, and the slashy stakes are already looking pretty nice. However, the second shackle application proves much more fruitful, by providing me with a bleed and jumping me straight into phase 2. 
I now have the misfortune of actually having to fight the boss because the shackle is no longer useful. However, for the first time in my life, I play this kind of smart. My regular strategy in phase 2 of Morgan is normally to just trade hits and pray I out DPS him. That is not an option with no vig levels though. I instead try and bait out his red fiery slash attacks and use the old strafe strategy to get in jump attacks. And this is, quite frankly, disgusting. So far, Dex has proven to be insanely OP, and Morgoth is no exception to the power of nimbleness and agility. There it is. Pretty good. Pretty good. Not the best thing we've used so far. Without the shackle, that would have been like super annoying, but not bad. Before heading any further into the game, I decide to return to the Land of the Lakes and enter Hogwarts so I can do Renala before I'll accidentally one-shot her. Between me and the Foot Queen lies one challenger, the Ginger Cat. I decide to use Patch's Spear for this guy, mostly because it's already plus 7 so I don't have to spend runes to upgrade another weapon. The hardest part of this run so far has actually been finding time to upgrade my dexterity. I've been spending so much on upgrading weapons and buying stones, it's still in the 50s at this point. Which is crazy because I started at 47. The spear seems to be doing fine work here though, so I finally get to save some money. L2! Bang! R1! Bang! Got him! I take the Nagakiba upgraded to plus 12 with the Keen Infusion into the Renala fight. I have the Jump Attack and Wing Sword Insignia with Ritual Sword Talismans for maximal offensive output. And it shows after I beat up the children and get to slam Renala. What did he say? I'm hitting hard and managed a phase transition with only one knockdown. That's pretty good. I was worried about the second part though, because she can do a lot of damage. And the summons can be super annoying. Lady Luck must be smiling down on this run though, because her first summon is the dragon. And I can essentially ignore this one by running into it. From here, it's a simple matter of running at the feet like a rabid dog and spamming R1. I'm definitely somehow overleveled for Renala, but that seems like a her problem, not really a me problem. Come here! Holy shit. <sighs> oh, so fast, dude. Nagakib is busted. S tier. Easy S tier. He fucking loved to see that. We now return to our regularly scheduled progression and head into the Forbidden Lands, then to the mountaintops of the Giants. Here I can finally grab the Somber Bell Bearing 3, which will get my regular weapons to level 18. I run all the way through the mountains to the Fire Giants Arena before leaving to set up my build for this fight. First I buy Morgoth's Sword, which has high deck scaling but a 17 arcane requirement. I can get that done by running into the Radon Hole to face off with the strongest enemy in the game. Me. Unfortunately for me, I forgot to have a weapon equipped when I showed up, so he has fists and I have a sword. Sucks to be him, I guess. Beating myself gives me the silver tier mask for plus 7 arcane. I also get a somber stone 8 and 9 to get the sword leveled to plus 9. Now I can fight the ginger giant, aka fat bastard. I go back and forth on whether or not this is a good or bad fight. For this run, it just feels a bit slow. I'm not doing high or low damage, and phase 1 feels pretty standard, with me just biting the ankles like a chihuahua until I get a stagger. From here, I just chase him around a bit more until I get the final hit into phase dose. I look for the right grass and stand by it so I can immediately hit his hand when he does his slam. And my luck really just keeps on going because after a few hits, the fat bastard staggers and I get a little riposta in. That's pretty much the best start I could ask for here. I proceed to play patty cake with my boy, just patiently taking my single hits anytime his hands touch the ground. It's slow going until he makes the critical error of attempting an elbow slam, leaving his eyeball vulnerable. I immediately embrace the eye poke and he can't handle the pain of the old toothpick in the eye. That was way easier than I expected it to be. Morgoth's sword kind of fucks, dude. Before beginning my quest into Fair Missoula, I need to come up with a strategy for the foreskin duo. So I pick up my favorite weapon, the spiky balls. They get juiced up and then I head off on my quest to acquire a bunch of pots for making roofies, before finally returning to the big cauldron and aiding my wife in committing divine arson. I skedaddle through most of Ferrum before realizing I've forgotten a key piece of my strategy, Assassin's Gambit. So I go murder Bernasty, then I have to murder Prom Boy so I can give the succubus her necklace back. I find the succubus again by the Dectus Lift and let her seduce me so I can get the key from Tanith which unlocks Assassin's Gambit from Bernasty's Bell Bearing. 
The strat for the godskins is fairly simple. Step 1, Assassin's Gambit. Step 2, use my stealth skills to spawn them in and throw pots. They can't see me, so they go to the roofies and sleep themselves. Now I Cragblade and smack the fat boy. But the damage is low. Uh oh. I normally have a lot of buffs for this, but I figured with my high dex level, just Cragblade would be fine. I was wrong. Once Fatty finishes rolling, I almost die trying to kill him, but eventually I do make it happen. And now Skinny is awake. God damn it. I do get a quick sleep off on him and do the exact same thing I just did. Luckily, Skinny has much less health, so I do actually have enough damage to kill him without issue. Now we have the return of Fatty. I do get my roofies off again, and I'm hoping the health bar is low enough that I can finish him here. And it looks like I will, until I miss the Riposta. What the fuck am I doing, man? Come on! Yeah, okay, I got really nervous. Holy shit. That was not as good as I thought it was going to be. Balls not great if keen. Noted. Next update here after Godskins, I'm at 77. Not bad. Time to run through the rest of Ferrum. This area I lovingly refer to as the Bird Run, and it is almost impossible to get through here with low vig. So instead, I have learned the Bird Skip. First, I have to sneak off this ledge and do a fancy fall onto another ledge to get to an elevator. This elevator takes me to the hard part. I Assassin's Gambit past a werewolf and jump onto a ledge I definitely shouldn't be able to stand on. Now I do some very precise walking and jumping that is way harder than it looks. And... boom! I've now made it to the bridge before Malekith. I stop here to quick grab the somber bell bearing 5, and I now have all the smithing stone bell bearings. So from now on, just assume all my weapons are plus 9 or plus 24, because they will be. The logical thing to do here would be to fight Malekith. So, I'm gonna go start trying to get access to the DLC. I skip through the mountains to Castle Soul to face Nile and his dick riders. I'll need the Howley Tree Medallion for Melania, so I'll also use it to get to Moog. A little bit of that two birds with one stone mentality. As you can see, the strategy here is simple. I parry everything. Nile used to be one of the most annoying fights for me. And then I discovered parry, and now he's one of the easiest fights. Kinda crazy how that happened, but whatever, I'll take it. May he and his summons rest in piss. Finish him! Oh yeah. First try, baby? With that done, I go and get my first medallion half. Then, I head to the albino village and channel my inner Snape to murder Albus and get the second half. Before heading to Moog, I need to get a new weapon, which involves going to the cliff bottom catacombs to claim the scythe. Then, I go to Castle Morn and murder Edgar to get his halberd, so I can put spinning strikes on my new scythe. I meander into the consecrated snowfield and stop to grab the flowing curve sword, which is yet another dex weapon I will probably use later. There's one other great item in the snowfields, locked behind the Erdtree Avatar. Avatars are stupid easy to fight though, so I murk the shit out of them and get the Thorny Crystal Tear, which will boost my consecutive attacks even further. Trust me, this is going to make things spicy. Now I can murder the Sanguine Noble and get to the Palace of Moog. Instead of fighting him though, I decide I'm going to get dummy OP for this fight. First, I go to Eleonora and mess up the cheese to kill her, but she dies anyways and gives me the purifying tear, so it's fine. Now, I'm going to do a ton of work to get a single talisman to maximize my build. First, I talk to Gallery, who's like, herder, get a needle. Then, I decimate a cheap Nile knockoff to get said needle for Gallery. Then, Gallery's like, cool needle, bro. Let me make it fancy. Go give it to Millicent. Then, Millicent shanks herself with the needle, and I go to meet her in Altus to get her an arm. I also stop to visit my boy Melee and do another crime to get the Ant Spur Rapier, which is critical for this run. Now I have to go murder a skinny white dude by repeating my earlier Rufy strat, which works way better and I just annihilate him. And here comes the sad part. Millicent must die. I make it quick for her, but it breaks my heart to do this. But then I get Millicent's prosthesis and that makes me feel way better. Time for the OP build. I toss the thorny tear in my physic, then equip the wing sword and Millicent prosthesis to giga boost consecutive attacks. I also add the ritual sword talisman for even more damage on top of all that. Now to show off the strat. I start the fight by just getting in light attacks and waiting for Moog to do his little countdown animation. Once he does, I start blasting. Come on, 
That's a lot of damage. And I get so close. But because I have no stamina, I have to pause and regen. And even though I do get to follow up and start spinning again, Moog escapes with a literal pube of health. Oh, so close. Damn. Bang. There it is. <laughs> I almost one phased him. That, that was close. Before we get into the DLC, we get our decks to 90, and now it's time for the part of this run that's really gonna suck. My first goal in the DLC is to gather the Skidoo Tree Fragments. Upgrading these increases my damage negation and damage dealt. I consider this more like an upgrade system like weapons and not leveling like stats, so I will be using Skabop Fragments in this run. Now that we all understand that, I wandered the DLC grabbing tons and tons of Skididly Fragments, and also picking up a bunch of new dex weapons like the Backhand Blades, the Great Katana, the Beast Claws, the Swift Spear, and the Tooth Whip. I also pick up the Two-Handed Talisman, which boosts damage when you two-hand weapons. Very creative name on that one. I then head into the Shadow Keep and drain Mesmer's Bathwater so I can access some bosses later. After all that, I get to Skadooble Blessing 9 and take a secret coffin in Shadow Keep to get to my first DLC boss, Rakshasa. She drops good armor and a weapon I can use, so this seems like a good way to start the DLC. Oh, never mind. She fucks. 14 attempts later, I've switched to the scythe because it's pretty good at abusing NPCs. The good reach lets me spam our ones, and being hyper aggressive makes this fight go real quick. She drops another great katana, but more importantly, she drops her armor, which gives me a 2% damage buff per piece in exchange for taking more damage. This should be super useful when I find bosses that one shot me. Alright, I'll admit that wasn't really an intense first fight. So let's go do our first DLC remembrance, the Boar Man Gaius. I equip the Swift Spear and I use some defense talismans with Ritual Sword and head in to give this a try. Unfortunately, I get fucked swiftly and mercilessly, many times. Almost 30 tries in and an hour later, I'm deeply regretting my life choices. I've never played the DLC with low vig and it sucks. I can survive single hits, but any combo absolutely eviscerates me. I'm also doing baby damage. On god, it's like I'm using an actual toothpick to hit the pig. If I was teleported into the game and managed to punch Gaius with my own bare fists, I guarantee it would do more damage than my almost max level spear. Luckily, I've been pretty much exclusively running the DLC for the past month and a half, and I've been on this fight for an hour, so I've gotten pretty good at my dodging rhythm. The swift spear also hits super quickly, as it should, because it's literally called the swift spear, but that means I can at least attack without having to worry too much about getting punished. I feel like I kind of have this figured out, but after this little incident, I'm pretty worried about what the DLC has in store for me. Oh, there it is! Holy shit, that was a fucking journey. Oh, the, the DLC is going to be a problem. DLC is going to be a serious issue. On the bright side, after defeating Gaius, I finally get to 99 decks, and I also get a bunch of skittles as a reward for my efforts. This gets me to scat level 14, which is at least encouraging for the next few bosses. On top of all that, I can use the Pigman's Remembrance to get his Sword Lance, which absolutely slaps. I think it's time to do something a bit easier. I make my way into and through Bellarat to the door of the Double Furries. I want to try out Rakshasa's Great Katana here, so I use my Ritual Talismans with the Warrior Jar Shard, because this allegedly has a good Ash of War. Let's just see the damage first though. Oh yeah, that's hot. See, this is more what I was expecting when I had a gazillion levels of decks. High damage, fast hits, boss health bars depleting faster than my will to live. This is beautiful. If I wasn't such a dehydrated degenerate gamer, it would bring a tear to my eye. Oh, I'm getting them right here. Come here, bitch. That's right, stupid furries. You won't hold me down. That was electric. So, in keeping with that theme, I go and upgrade the Bolt of Grand Sacks for my next boss. This weapon is best known for its Ash of War that's a giant lightning bolt. So, I'm gonna make a build to maximize its potential. To do that, I head into the Windhem Catacombs and claim the Lightning Scorpion Charm. I then venture over to a jail where I come face to face with the second gooner. He's pretty weak to all damage though, and kinda sucks. 
So I cave his chest in with my katana and am rewarded with the Godfrey icon. This boosts charged skills, which will work for my bolt. Finally, I go and chop down a tree to get the lightning tier. Now I'm ready to book it through Castle Enos to my next boss, Rolana. I do stop to pick up the Milady and Rolana's cameo for later use. I equip all my new trinkets and Rakshasa's armor for maximal efficiency. Now all there is left to do is give it a try. Oh yeah, that is simply gorgeous. There's no way this could go wrong. Instead of throwing my head at the wall, I decide to seek out the universal problem solver, more damage. Because more damage, more gooder. I pull a Zeus on this poor knight and lightning bolt him to death for Golden Val. Alright, time for another attempt, but with more damage. No, I see why people like this thing. 6,000 damage is dummy thick. This did take multiple attempts because Rolana has the annoying feature of being able to dodge ranged attacks. I did manage to find a way to space her that let the bolt travel fast enough to hit her before she dodged while also keeping me out of harm's way. But it was finicky and took a while to perfect. I figured it out finally on this attempt though, so it's time to finish off Mesmer Simp. Oh, ah, that's right. <laughs> ah, wouldn't be a ratty video without a boss trade. I quick backtrack through Castle Enos and grab the Wing Stance Ash of War from Milady. I equip that and a keen scaling on my sword, which actually puts it up to a B and Dex scaling. Not too shabby. This weapon is great at destroying NPCs, so I head to the Dragon Pit, jump off a cliff, tragically survive, and begin my battle with the Ancient Dragon Man. Although it's less a battle and more just me pressing L2 and R2 repeatedly. I hate NPC fights though, so I'll take up using the broken weapon that allows me to just repeatedly hit this silly looking man's until he's dead. With him in Dragon Heaven, I get the privilege of traversing an entire mountaintop to reach Big Baddie Bale. Fortunately, Dragon Man dropped a katana that is usually a banger for this fight. Let's see how it does. Okay, that is not spectacular. I guess this is going to be one of those fights where I actually have to play the game and dodge and shit. Bummer. Still, this is probably better than my other weapons. The Dragon Hunter Katana does extra damage to dragons, makes sense. And it also has a poke attack that does pierce as its quick attack option. Bale happens to not have resistance to pierce, which makes it the best option for fighting him. Overall, this is looking good. The only bummer is since I don't use summons, I don't get Egon's speech. So I'm just gonna put it in here anyways. Scale you might be, foul dragon, but I will riddle with holes your rotten hide with a hail of harpoons, with every last drop of my being. Yeah! Oh, this could be it, ladies and gentlemen. Oh no. Yeah! There it is. Fucking beautiful at the end there. Holy shit. <laughs> Pretty sure I hit the L2 with no FP, and that's why I didn't kill, but whatever. It still works. That was actually a really fun fight. I can love Bale. Moving forward, I progress through the Dark Light Catacombs to eventually fight Midra. But first, there is Jory. I'm rocking the Ritual Talismans and the Dragon Crest Shield Talisman, which kind of have become my defaults for this run. Jory is a really dumb boss. We are blessed that he is super easy to backstab. This little factor makes an otherwise very annoying fight at least somewhat palatable. The backstabs grant immunity, which means if I just chase his booty and shank it, his plethora of summons can't hurt me, which makes this much less irritating. I decided to use the flowing curve sword I picked up earlier here. Its stats looked kinda bad, and I didn't like the move set. So this seemed like an easy way to use a new weapon while saving the good ones for harder bosses. Oh look, he's dead. Splendid. I can now traverse the haunted forest and mansion all the way to Midra. He has the most health of all the DLC bosses, 
so I decided to use the backhand blades, which I've heard are really good, along with a multi-hit build. The plan being, hit them a lot and hope it hurts. Looks like it does in fact hurt. The attacks are quick, and since Midra is weak to slash, this is looking like an excellent choice. Also, these weapons feel sick. I rarely find weapons where I really like every facet of the moveset, but the backhand blades are grade A spicy. I feel like a ninja, leaping out of attacks only to jump right back at my enemy for some speedy stabs before immediately backing out again. And considering they're doing good damage on Midra, I have to imagine most enemies would just absolutely fucking melt to these things. Oh, there it is! Finish him! Yeah, that's right. Backhand blades fucking cook, dude. Holy shit, they're so good. For my next trick, I'm gonna burn down a tree. First, I need the Fire Spark Perfume Bottle. This is one of the new unlimited use perfume weapons added in the DLC, and the fire one just happens to scale with dex. Next, I pick up the Fire Scorpion Charm, then I go to test out my new Sparkies on a baby tree. And quite frankly, these things are stupid. They make a little jingly noise when you use them and absolutely shit out damage. The small tree is burned to death, and I get the fire damage tier as a reward. Now I skedaddle down to the Skaboob Tree Avatar and set up a little fire damage build to cook some wood. Off rip, these look absolutely disgusting. A facial to the tree delivers ungodly damage. Call me Saruman, cause I'm burning trees today, baby. The little fires take care of phase one and like four hits. I do whip out the misery cord since reposting Mr. Treebeard makes him spawn in with less health. Phase two seems a little tankier, but that could be because I'm hitting the wrong part of the head. He still gets smoked fast as fuck though. In phase three, I go to dodge the holy nuke and then something weird happens. Oh my god! <laughs> okay, so the running R2 was the move the whole time apparently. What the fuck? I'm, I can't wait to edit that and see the replay of the damage. He just fucking evaporated right there. Yeah, I watched that like 70 times while editing this. That was diabolical. Time to get more dex weapons. For my next journey, I'm gonna do the Volcano Manor questline. I kill an old man to start. Then I go and kill a second old man. Then I fight a regular aged man. And once he's dead, I get a kinky metal whip. This is just the start of my questing though. I return to the Shadowlands and talk to Hornscent and then Lita, which makes Lita decide Hornscent should die. She might be crazy, but I kind of like that. To assist my crazy waifu, I have to go through the front of Shadowkeep, where I encounter the Holy Hipporcupine. Me and Milady pull up on this divine beast and start swinging. This is actually a pretty easy fight. I stay in front of his gaping maw, dodge the bites, and press R2. The first time I fought this creature, it seemed really gross, but I have since found the rhythm and I've come to enjoy this fight. He's still ugly though. My wife and I can now battle the horn scent. This will spare me from having to fight him later in the NPC gangbang, which is incredibly helpful. Lita could probably win this fight on her own, and with my help, it's a pretty lethal moment in time for my boy. Rip Hornsent. He tried his best. It wasn't good, but he tried. I'm still not done questing though. There's a new scythe in the DLC you obtain by doing Onsbok's quest. I liked the base scythe, so we go to Onsbok and begin the process. He moves to the Shadow Keep, and I have to find a scroll to give him. Unfortunately, the Elden Ring wiki was confusing, so I also started and completed Freya's quest here, cause I thought I had to do that. I will regret this later. Now I give Onsbok his scroll, then sneak my way to Mesmer. I set up my standard build with a jump attack talisman and dual whips. I've never used whips and thought they might be good on Mesmer. Nope, they are not. The damage is super mid, and while they have good range, the power stance attacks are actually pretty slow, which isn't great for Mesmer. I was also operating under the delusion that whips did slash damage, which is Mesmer's weakness. Fortunately, Bushy showed up, and when I mentioned this, he called me stupid and told me the truth. Whips are strike damage. Well, most whips are. In Carry a Manor, there lies an exception, the Urumi. This whip is also a sword and does do slash damage, perfect for Mesmer. I swap to the two-handed talisman and give my new whip a spin. I've never used the Urumi before, and I am wrong for that. This thing straight up comes. Speedy, high damage, and crazy range? 
That just seems unfair. However, late onset orphan here has all those traits as well. So I would say Arumi's just evening the playing field. I do wonder what Mesmer's beef with me is though. Is he mad I killed his mom so I could bang Ronnie for a thousand years? Or maybe he's mad I killed his mom so I could consume the world with the flames of chaos. Or maybe he's mad I killed his mom to become the old lord. Wait, wait, there was a common theme in those. Well shit, tough for him. I get this twink to phase two and now the real fight begins. Dead Queen's son is now in Super Snake Saiyan mode, but I'm a New York brand rat. Ain't no snake eating me, dog. The pace picks up significantly now, and I am here for it. He may be agile, but I am the master of dexterity in this run, not him. We duel like two alley cats, swipes being exchanged faster than the eye can see. Well, fast swipes on my end. If he hits me, I die, so it's less hits being exchanged and more just me absolutely cooking like Walter White. Oh, this is gonna be close. R1! Yeah! There we go! <laughs> oh my god. Hell yes, dude. Mesmer kind of fucks when you have low vig, man. Jesus. The final fight felt really good, though. The Arumi is good. That was a grand time. Moving on, I'm gonna go beat up Skeletor. He's weak to faith damage. So I looked into the faith dex weapons with holy damage. Turns out there's barely fucking any. One of the few weapons I found that could work was the black knife. So I pull an uno reverse and assassinate the assassin to earn my next weapon. I need 18 faith for this little pointy stabby. So I get the faith talisman and America's scar seal to get that done. Since I'm doing a holy damage build, I also dump on Anastasia to get the sacred scorpion charm for more holy damage. Now I head to the hole in the ground and make the old holy damage build before attempting self delete. That fails, so I guess I'll fight the boss. Damn, that ash of war is pretty hot. Unfortunately, the damage is ass, and this weapon has the range of a T-Rex's arms. Rather than addressing those issues and getting better at the game, I'll try something different. I go get sacred blade for a holy buff via L2 and put that on the great katana. Now I do the holy damage talisman in tier with ritual sword and the two handed talisman because fuck defensive stuff I guess? Is it all worth it? Yes. Yes it is. This is the third and final great katana I can use for the major bosses and I must say all three are amazing. Of the three however, this is the only one that lets you choose the ash of war since it's a regular smithing weapon and I think that makes it my favorite. Having the ability to access other damage types like holy in this fight just makes weapons so much more useful. As for my fight against the slug horse and skeleton man, it's going well. I didn't bring any blue flasks, so I do eventually run out of the damage buff, but still, the great katana's move set is pretty great for this battle. The slug runs really quickly, but the lunging poke on the katana means I can usually close the distance as he retreats, and I'm not whiffing as much as I have with other weapons. The length of this weapon in general just makes hitting all the attacks a lot easier. I've always been of the opinion that size doesn't matter, but I'm being proven wrong here. This is it. Finish him! Oh, poke! There we go. <laughs> oh, much easier with the great katana. Black knife is just kind of dog shit. That's okay. We did it. We're getting close to done with the DLC. Three bosses from being done with the DLC to be exact. For the bug girl, I decide to get Mesmer's Impaler from his Remembrance. Fire damage is good here, so I set up the fire build with a scorpion charm in tier and head in to tear up the Ramanusi. Uh oh, that looks really bad across the board. All the attacks are doing dookie damage. Can't I just once have a good idea to start with on these bosses? No? Okay, I also tried to use the Beast Claws here, and they were a little less disappointing, but still not what I needed. So, I finally committed to using one of the better weapons in my arsenal, the Sword Lance from the Pigman. With a keen attunement, this thing gets nasty deck scaling, and it shows in the damage. This weapon did have a 21 strength requirement, so I have to use Radagon's Nut and the Omen Mask to wield it, but that was easily worth it. The point of this run is to try a lot of different dex weapons and builds, and even though this sword isn't necessarily a dex weapon, it might be my favorite so far. Like this thing just slaps. 
I don't know why pokey weapons give me so much dopamine, but they just do. I will say, this may be one of the more challenging fights in the run so far. Ramina has combos that can absolutely obliterate me with my inch long health bar, and prior to switching weapons, I could barely get her health down before getting centipede slapped into my next attempt. It's kind of funny, because at proper levels, this might be the easiest DLC boss, but with no vig, I had to reach in the bag and pull out the most OP weapon I could find. If you haven't used the pig's lance yet, do it. This is the only infusible remembrance weapon, and it seems to get great scaling with whatever you use. It might actually be my new favorite weapon. This thing is just that good, and my bug wife is feeling it. Oh, oh, there it is. That took forever. Time to interact with the Pope and the Catholic Church. After an enlightening chat, I am given a necklace and told to go find some mystery bells. The first one is deep to the south near the cum horse, and I give this one a good suck, accomplishing the first part of the mission. The next bell is way north in the hinterlands, and after a little suckle, my mission is essentially done. Before returning, I do murder this omen killer in a trash heap for an iris of occlusion. This will let me get a weapon after I fight Matir. Before that though, I must give the Pope's chair a warm little sniff and murder the guard Anna. She do give me some claws I can use though, so that's sick. Now I can lick my third bell and finally access Matir, the mother of fingers. Let's do this. Fuck, Never mind. That sucked. I'm gonna go do something else. I commit my case of divine arson in this run to get to inner Elam. There is a reason for this. The final four scab tree fragments are here. And I want to grab those so I can do the most damage possible to Matir. So I get them and also the Golden Braid before heading in to the NPC gangbang. The Golden Braid is good for Lita and the throwing discs, so I figured it would be a good option here. I also have to summon my boy Onsbok for this fight. I normally wouldn't, but to finish his quest he needs to be summoned and I really want his scythe, so whatever. This is a stupid fight anyways. I expected to only deal with Lita and Dane here. But remember how I accidentally did Freya's quest? Yeah, apparently that makes her show up here. Fortunately, Rakshasa's great katana slaps the shit out of her, and she's dead before Dane pulls up. With Onsbok here, I can basically speedrun through this. Turns out, summons make the game way easier. Who knew? I do still do most of the damage to the enemies, like, by far most of the damage, but I do let Onsbok finish the fight so he feels useful. You're welcome, buddy. Now he's ready to give me a scythe as soon as I beat Radon. First though, I return to Matir, whips in hand, ready to smack her into submission. Uh, nope, the whips still fucking suck. I decide to switch to a weapon I know will work, the Smith Script Cirque. However, these annoyingly need 11 faith and intelligence, and I only have 10. I could use Merica's Sword Seal to solve this, but Matir is doing too much damage for me to want to opt in to the defensive penalties from that talisman. Instead, we are going to get some clothing that boosts stats. First, I head to the end of the bridge from Shadowkeep, where my boy Salsa chills, raining fire down on me. Killing him gives me the Salsa Hood for plus 2 int, which takes care of that requirement. Now for the really annoying part. I'm gonna go get the commoner's garb, which is a shirt that adds one faith. Unfortunately, it only drops from these Gostock lookalikes, and the drop rate is really low. I spend almost 30 minutes in Stormvale Castle, committing what is effectively a war crime, until I finally find my shirt. Hundreds murdered for me to get a shirt. That's Prime Elden Ring gameplay right there. I also need a plan to deal with Matir's nuclear spinning laser beam attack. It will almost certainly one-shot me. So I take my circumcisors over to the Avatar and Weeping Peninsula and quickly delete him for the Opaline Bubble Tier. If I pop this, I should be able to tank the lasers. Hopefully. I have the Giga Defense build with the Smithing Talisman to boost my throw attack damage and face off once again with Finger Mommy. And I'll tell you what, this fight starts off fast. The circles were an excellent decision on my part. They hit hard and because I can throw them, I can outspace most of Matir's slam attacks, which just make things a lot easier on me. I do my best impression of a baseball pitcher and just keep on throwing. It's all strikes for me, and before I know it, Matir gears up for her nuke. So I back up and drink the wrong fucking flask. Holy shit, bitch I lived. Holy shit, that was incredibly unexpected. 
I truthfully do not know how I survived that. I definitely should be dead. I absolutely refuse to squander this divine luck. I lock in and do my best not to throw. Even though that would be really funny and prime for content. Oh. Heal. Flee. Flee, 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 flee. This is it. Go. Oh. Oh. Holy shit. Woo. Let's go. Hooray. Yeah, that took almost two hours, so I was more disappointed in myself than excited to finish the fight. But little did I know then what I was in for next. I stop and grab the main gooch dagger before heading to Radon 2. This is a parrying dagger and it's new, so I decided it's the perfect option to parry Radon. With low health, I thought a blood answer for rot and bleed damaged mixed with a lot of parries would be the optimal strategy. In phase two, his combos will destroy me if I don't dodge perfectly, so interrupting them with parries seems all around better. One small issue, I've never parried Radon, and it shows. My challenges up to this point pale in comparison to what happened here. I died a ton. The parrying was sick when it worked and I got reposts, but when it didn't work, I died. Still, parrying allows for more damage windows and a faster fight is definitely in my favor. So how long did this take, you ask? Well, my best attempt happened on attempt 187 exactly 4 hours and 38 minutes into fighting this man's. At this point, I'm pretty nasty at parrying phase 1. Every parry allows for a follow up poke, and 3 parries gives me the spicy riposta. It was hard to tell, but usually right after my first repost, I could get in a rot, and pretty soon after a bleed would follow. Those two statuses, if procced, almost always led to phase 2 pretty quickly. It took a lot of time to figure this out, but once I had the routine down, I was burning phase 1. Phase 2 was the problem, as always. Missing any parries essentially meant death, and there were moves I simply couldn't parry, so I had to be constantly on the lookout for those, so I didn't parry some shit that was gonna slam me. Essentially, I had to be super vigilant and incredibly flexible as I switched between dodging and parrying, while also constantly maintaining my damage to not lose status effect buildup. It was legitimately hard to learn to do this. I think at this point, I had all the dodges and parries and damage windows down, absolutely. But stringing it all together long enough to kill him just requires so much focus. I could have switched to a higher damage weapon or a better parry, and that certainly would have made it easier. But the masochist in me decided to commit to this, and it seemed appropriate to use the rot weapon and the DLC parry dagger on Primer Dawn. I'll let my best attempt speak for itself. Alright, surely I survive. On your knees. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Who's the god now? It's me. I am Himothy. Holy shit. Uh. Hell yeah. I might just be the LeBron James of Elden Ring. It's high praise, but it could be true. And finally, the DLC is complete. That was much harder than I anticipated. But this is no time for celebration or rest. It is time to go to Mikola's Halig Tree for even more self-punishment. I quickly make my way to Loretta and set up a lightning damage build with the Lightning Beast Claws. After the DLC, it was nice to have this chill fight. I still think the Beast Claws suck, but Loretta is weak to lightning, so I'm just hoping that makes up for them being atrocious. Lightning Affinity also grants deck scaling, so we're actually seeing a pretty optimized Beast Claws build, but I don't know. Loretta is so easy, and the Claws are actually making this fight feel a little dangerous. I just really don't like the lunging attacks. These things carry you all over the place, no matter which type of attack you try to do. I don't know. Maybe these would be better on a strength build, and I do beat Loretta with them, Granted, it took about 30 years, but I did kill her, so maybe they aren't that bad. On to the goat, Melania. I do stop to grab the Dragon Crest Great Shield on the way. If I had this for the DLC, 
It might have been easier, but I didn't think of that. I was going to use the Bloodhound's claws on Melania, but then chat spoke up. Try the whips, coward. Who are you calling a coward, eh? Couldn't be me. So I pull out the whips, which I have decided are dog shit, and I'm pleasantly surprised. Turns out the whips always stagger Melania, so you can stand pretty far away and kind of just spam hits, and she won't do anything. It almost seems like she likes it. That thought scares me, and this also feels really cheesy. So I tactically and intentionally die to use the claws. The build here is pretty standard. Ritual Talismans with Dragon Crest Great Shield and Radagon's Nut. Nothing special. These claws though, these are special. They hit so fast, I'm almost always trying to get in two or three smackaroonies, and that does giga damage. Much like the whips, every attack staggers. But unlike the whips, I actually enjoy using these to fight Melania. The claws have short range, so I have to be up close, which just makes this fight feel so much faster. And more faster is more funner in my opinion. More faster also means I get more bleed procs, because the claws have innate bleed. Phase 1 is going super smooth, and I hit maybe my greatest waterfowl dodge ever right here. Oh yeah, that made me wet. I keep up my relentless pressure, and before I know it, phase 2 begins. Like a silly dum-dum, Melanie starts off phase 2 with less health, immediately giving me an advantage. I've always found this to be the harder of the two Melania phases, and today is no different. I am much more cautious in attacking and spend a lot of time backing up. She stalls quite a bit here though, hitting me with a waterfowl that I flee from and, and immediately following that up with her lovely clone attack. Luckily, I had good spacing for both of those. When she does finally settle into a more regular attack pattern, I take full advantage and start scratching her up like a demented cat. Or a demented rat. I think rats also scratch. Melania Thin tries to Scarlet Rot nuke me. But little does she know, this is the prime attack opportunity for me. I fucking cook her for trying to do me like her dawn. Slashy, slashy, slash, slash, slash. And you won't believe it, but this silly bitch literally tries to rot nuke me again as the end nears. <sighs> Guess she didn't learn. Oh, wait, this might be it. Yeah, boy. Bloodhound Claws, absolutely fucked. S tier. Holy shit. See, the key was the whips, right? I softened her up with the whips, like you should, then came in. That was, truthfully, a great time. I genuinely enjoyed that. Like a true rat, I immediately head underground and begin lighting torches to unlock the Skeledeer. Bambi is weak to fire, so after its abject failure at Romana, I once again pull out Mesmer's long, hard, well-shapen impaler. I get some faith boosting equipment to wield it, and my usual fire damage setup before trying to do Bambi like his daddy. That'll do. I'm not gonna one shot snipe Bambi like a professional hunter, but it looks like the spear's gonna redeem itself here. This is objectively one of the easiest fights in the game, and I wish I had more to say about it. The spear really made it a lot of fun. The deer is good at making space, which can be irritating, but since I can throw the spear, it's pretty easy to keep doing damage throughout the whole battle. Normally, there's a lot of downtime in this fight as you wait for the deer to approach, but I didn't really feel that with my ranged attack options. So yeah, for one of the few times ever, it was actually fun to go deer hunting. hey -ah. Oh, get in there. Juicy, dude. Oh, yeah. Oh. Mesmer's spear is redeemed. <laughs> After its many failures. Oh, finally a first try, boss. Thank you, dear, for your sacrifice. Time to go from deer hunting to snake hunting. Since I've done the whole Volcano Manor murder mission extravaganza, Tanith will just send me to Rikard. And I apologize, but there is no fun weapon to show off here. I'm humbly using the Serpent Hunter with a shield for this fight. The shield is not for blocking, though. This is an offensive shield. How, you ask? Well... Blocking light attacks from behind a shield with Serpent Hunter shoot out fast as fuck, boy. So I'm abusing this mechanic to spam attacks as fast as I can. I want to use a regular weapon here, but the lava surrounding the Lord of Blasphemy would kill me too quick for it to be manageable at low vig. So I am forced into using the gimmick for this fight. At, at least it's pretty cool. One more. Beautiful. 
Oh god, the red card fight sucks on these runs. So dumb. I now make a brief reappearance in the DLC, specifically in the Cerulean Coast, on a little island off the south shore. Here, I find an exotic dancer, and I show her the whips, like a true gentleman. She likes them so much, she gives me her clothes and swords. Perfect for my next fight. And naturally, my next fight is Placidasax. Why was the Dancing Blade of Rana perfect for this fight, Ratty? The answer is the quick attacks. For such a large and sluggish boss, you would think big slow weapons would be good against Placidus Axe. And they are, but I have a dex build, and don't have many options that have high damage per hit, so I've instead opted into the classic multi-hit build to take chunks out of the Dragon King's juicy health bar. This turned out to be a master stroke on my end. Classy is frequently an irritating roadblock for me on low health runs, but that didn't seem to be the case here. The Dancing Blades not only did hella damage, but I think they granted me increased agility. It was them or the lovely clothes I got from the stripper, because for once, I wasn't getting annihilated by Placidus Axe's dive bombs from the sky. Oh shit. This is the one I really don't remember how to dodge. Here we go. Oh, I nailed it. I'm a genius. Hell yeah, dude. Damn. Damage was kind of giga fucked right there. That was pretty nice. After finishing off Bale's mission, I remembered I had done Onsbox quest and went to get the Obsidian Lumina Scythe. I don't plan on using it quite yet, but I didn't want to forget it again. Time for more kinky whipping, this time with Ghost Loretta. I need to start Ronnie's quest and this horse girl is in the way. The whips have sucked so far, but... Ah, finally. Of course it was the horse girl who's into whips. I should have known. I use them to finish her off and it's on to mommy Ronnie. I'll be brief with this quest. Ronnie tells me to find a blade and I find it for her. She takes the blade and offers me a statue. The statue turns the tower upside down and by going to the top, or maybe the bottom, of the tower, I get the curse mark of death, which will unlock the Fortisax fight. To get to that fight, I head into the capital sewers where I hit a six skip before fighting Moog Jr. I whip out the Godskin Stitcher, which is a heavy thrusting sword, and get to work. It seems like no matter what level or build I come here with, this guy just does not take a lot of damage. He literally is just phase one of Big Moog though, and I have that fight down, so he gets worked like a teenager at McDonald's, and I now get to delve deeper. I hit another sick and completely unnecessary skip to get through a jumping puzzle, before traversing to Godwin's dead body. Here, I am ambushed by Fia Simps. I'm pretty over NPC fights at this point, so the Circumcisers come out and they do some outlandish damage. This can be an annoying fight, but this weapon made it trivial. So if you're ever struggling here, use the Circs. I wasn't sure exactly what would be good for Fortisax, so I just went with a defensive build and the Godskin Stitcher Part 2, but with a bleed attunement for shits and gigs. Now on to the most criminal atrocity of a god-awful fight that could possibly exist. Fortisax. It still blows my mind that FromSoft got this so wrong. My strat is chase the legs and poke as always, but like that's all you can ever do in this fight, regardless of build. I just don't understand how we went from Dark Eater Madeir in Dark Souls 3 to this. Someone is smoking fat dick at the FromSoft studios for them to think this was a good idea for a fight. I spend more time whiffing Fortisax's legs and running away than actually fighting. At least it's pretty easy, so I guess that's one redeeming factor. Oh my god. Please. Ooh, I'm free. Thank god. Worst fight in the game. I hate you. There is one thing worse than Fortisax in this game, and that's the Lake of Rot. What the fuck, Michael Zaki? What the fuck is this man? After getting the grace at the end of the lake, I head back to Round Table to buy the Dragon King's Crag Blade and the Hand of Melania, two exceptional dex weapons, allegedly. I I've never used them. So instead of doing any testing, I take the Dragon Sword straight to Estelle. Holy shit, that is actually a gross Ash of War. I tactically retreat and make a build for it with the Warrior Jar Shard and the lightning damage buffs, since it does lightning damage. It takes a couple of tries to get it to hit, because it's kind of finicky with how it sort of teleports you towards the enemy, but when it does hit, it hits like a truck. This is gaming. Like unironically, I love this attack. 
I feel like a whole ass anime character using their ultimate move when I use this shit. I'm all teleporting and then exploding in a shockwave of lightning and then the health bar just giga dips. It's, this is straight up fun. Oh no. The scariest attack in the game that can be avoided by running at a 45 degree angle. Crazy. Here we go. Bang! Hell yeah, dude. This thing fucks. I'm a fan. It's almost time for the final gauntlet of bosses. But first, one more weapon. I return to the church and assassinate the false pope. Now his knight is all sad, so I give her the iris of occlusion I found at the trash heap. And I think she dies, but I get her sword, so I don't really care. The sword of knight does a little magic damage, but scales with dex. So I add the magic damage tier, along with ritual sword and the two hand talisman for damage, before heading in to start the final gauntlet with Malekith. Possibly the coolest boss in the game. Phase 1 is very chill for me. The damage is a little less than I'd hoped for, but it's certainly manageable. I spend most of my time trying to bait out the ground slam attack, and then just giving him some friendly ass pokes. You know, just like normal friends, just touching each other's booties and whatnot. After a lot of this, the ultimate furry goes Super Saiyan, and now it's a real battle. No more friendship here, me and the furries got beef. But that's lore for another day. My damage is still kind of dog water, but I just decide to channel the rat spirit. I become nimble and quick, my reactions enhanced by the powers of my ancestors. The power flows through me as I evade and punish everything Malekith has to offer. There is no mercy for him here, just me and my shadowy blade. Time for a sick nasty anime finisher. Nice. Little L2 gaming right there. With that, the capital burns down and I return. With the hand of Melania ready for Gideon. I do put on the dancer's clothes here because they boost dancing attacks. And like the Ash of War is called Waterfowl Dance. I head in ready for an epic battle, starting off like Melania herself. And oh, oh my, oh, oh my. Huh? Yeah, my face says it all. That was completely disturbing. I realized here I had missed a critical dex weapon, the Cross Naginata. I give it a lightning attunement with a lightning damage build because Daddy Godfrey is actually weak to lightning. Let's shock him. Damage is kinda mid actually, but I get spicy reach and fast attacks, so it'll be fine. Phase one is a pretty fun little dance. There's jump attack windows and plenty of time for multiple hits after he tries to land his big combos. This fight, more than any other in the game, has a great rhythm. It's dodges and counters straight back into dodges. Truly a battle between two Giga Chads. But that's nothing compared to phase two. Horalu is him. He's got that dog in him. But I have trained for this moment more than any other. If there was a great rhythm in phase one, that ain't got shit on phase two. I'm bobbing and weaving like prime Muhammad Ali, taking every tight little opening I can find to weave in some damage. Some would call my attacks lightning quick. Get it? Get it? <laughs> no, in all seriousness, this is a fast fight though. In less than a minute, I managed to bring Horalu to his knees and execute him with a final blow. Ooh, finish him. Yeah, this weapon is busted. I, I can see why it's a fan favorite. One boss left. I equip the Claws of Night and the Obsidian Lumina here. Technically, Radagon and Elden Beast are one boss, but I want to use two weapons because they feel so unique. I set up the two-handed damage build for the scythe and head in to give the ginger lord an attempt. Unfortunately, the damage looks a bit pathetic out of the scythe. So I pull the old tactical death to retreat and decide to try the claws instead, swapping the two-hand talisman for the jump attack one instead. Shit, not much better. I'm not sure what to do here. Oh wait. Never mind, I just need to hit the old multiple light attacks here, and these claws absolutely rip. In the first few seconds of the fight, I've already taken out over half of America's boyfriend's health. And this isn't even the claws in their best form. Technically, they have bleed, which Radagon is immune to. But holy shit, if I was also getting bleed procs on top of this damage, yeah, that would be absolutely obscene. The sloppy seconds taker here stands no chance. 
and I get him with a final scratch before hot swapping my helmet to wield the scythe, as well as swapping the jump attack talisman for the two hand for more damage on all attacks. Time to fight alien space Jesus. I already like the scythe much better here than I did on Radagon. It's not disgustingly OP like other things I've used in this run, but it's certainly way cooler. Sue me, but the scythes just please the former teen edgelord in me. So I begin to chip away at the Elden Beast. He's a big slow slug, so I can get in a lot of hits when I do finally manage to catch up to him. The problem is he tends to run away pretty quickly, so it becomes a game of rat and mouse. As always, the biggest threat on a low vig run such as this is Elden Stars. Well, it was, but since Torrent was added into this fight with the DLC launch, I can now hop on my magic donkey and skirt away. Now that the greatest threat has been launched, I get much more aggressive, and I think the Cosmic Slug struggled with that. I'm just a little guy, so I imagine it's really hard to hit me when I'm ferociously rolling and springing around, hitting him with a weapon the size of a toothpick. Really sounds like a him problem though, not a me problem. Let's finish this. Yeah, good try. Jump attack. R1! R1! Yeah, there we go. It is done. It is fucking done. And that's how I beat every major boss in Elden Ring and its DLC while only leveling dexterity. It was a ton of work, but super fun. This is by far my longest video. So if you liked it and you're still here, check out some of my more regular offerings on screen now. That's it. Until next time, be good, be kind, adios.